Hello, everyone, and welcome to my presentation titled Online Grassroots Language Revitalization, Virtual Communities as Breathing Spaces. In this presentation, I'm going to be talking about mostly these three aspects. I'm going to introduce the, um, the term digital language divide and what it means and how um, we can counteract this with digital presence. Uh, we're going to discuss the use of media, particularly social media for language revitalization. And finally, we're going to talk about virtual communities, the establishment of virtual communities as breathing spaces for these minoritized languages and as a, low key, a locus for language revitalization. This presentation has three goals. I'm going to be mostly focusing on the first goal here um, due to time constraints. But I will also touch upon the other two. Um, so I want to outline the uses of virtual communities as reading spaces for minoritized languages. I also want to highlight the huge potential that these communities and that social media as a whole has as a database for linguistic research. Um, and also try to raise some ethical considerations of online language activism and research. Um, and I hope that we can also discuss this much more in depth in the Q&A session. So the term digital language divide that was uh, kind of put forward by Soria in 2016, um, it's basically this idea that the fact that um, some languages some languages are unequally uh, represented online or not represented in online at all, that entails inequality and that uh, it, it is inequality of linguistic rights and digital opportunities, but also of very importantly, access to services and information, which we've seen very notoriously now during these, um, the era of COVID, right? Um, but also an equal access to technological development as a whole, and digital digni dignity, and opportunities for language survival. There are less, fewer opportunities for language survival um, if the language is not available online. Now, we one way of counteracting this uh, might be you, you can think, oh, we can use media to counteract this. And it's probably the only way that a lot of communities have to counteract this. Many communities don't have the infrastructure to just have like big institutional websites or um, some of the bigger platforms available in their own language, such as maybe Twitter, which is translated into just a very, very few selected number of languages. So some communities don't have that. So how can we use media to um, counteract this digital language divide? Um, however, media, the relationship between media and language revitalization hasn't always been very nice. Um, Fishman in his um, revisited um, language shift in 2001 claims that media at best creates only a virtual community and he criticizes this as opposed to the community events such as uh, in the neighborhood or the family that actually really have an impact on language use. And um, how even, even if that is um, somehow true, that's it's also true that Fishman said that almost 20 years ago. Well, actually now it's, it is 20 years ago. Um, and the concept of virtual community has changed a lot since then, and it has become very normalized. And we all uh, we all partake in some virtual communities. Actually, many of us partake in a lot of them, even maybe created some of them, right? So um, the reality nowadays is very different from what um, what it may have been 20 years ago. There is, however, a standing issue when we talk about the use of media for language revitalization that I always like to acknowledge. Um, it was identified by Jones in 2013, at least officially, and it's that it's very difficult to attribute a direct relationship between media and linguistic behavior. That is, it's very, we see a correlation that is very, very obvious. We see that the um, speaker X uses their language much more often, and at the same time, speaker X um, consumes media in the minoritized language much more often. However, it's very difficult to say whether the this person speaks the language more often because they consume the media in the language, or they consume the media in the language because they already are like using the language very often, and that's the reason why they choose to um, 
to consume this media. So it's very difficult to establish uh, causality here, but we know that there is a correlation that we can still study and exploit. If we talk more specifically about social media, um, we are right now, or a lot of many languages are in a stage of development um, that we are all actually right now in a stage of development of um, internet and communication online that Kelly Holmes and Atkinson's called the performance era. And that is basically a moment in time where you as individual are have like zero spatial and temporal constraints to take part on communities, take part in communities, or create your own community, create your own media outlet, have people follow you, um, et cetera. Like I can start my own blog post and maybe who knows it'd be successful and have a lot of followers, um, such as like YouTubers nowadays, or you can start your own thing. Um, we are a bit like, of course here, that's, there are algorithms and it's not, 100% just free and without any, um, without any um, um, difficulty to, towards this goal, but you can start your own media nowadays and you can create a community around that media, right? And this goes with ideas of deterioration of language and contested ideologies of homogeneity and monolingualism as a whole, which benefit a lot minoritized languages, especially languages that are in process of reclamation that um, languages in which um, the, the territory is, or it's very difficult to practice the language in a particular geographical area, um, um, communities in which the, the speakers are dispersed, um, communities that are reclaiming that language and relearning that language, and therefore the ideas of purity of the language may also discourage them from using them. So um, this, um, this more open um, approach to creation uh, of media um, gives an opportunity to, to minoritized languages to uh, reclaim also their own spot online. Digital language presence, therefore, if we achieve that, um, encourages language use in different contexts. It narrows the digital language divide that we were talking about before. It raises awareness of linguistic diversity. Basically, if we make more languages visible online, people will see more languages as well. Um, and people will just know that they exist, right? Um, it strengthens the connection between speakers and their languages. Um, so now they have a platform where they can use it, where they can use it very often, when, um, where they can engage with several different people, not just maybe their family or friends, but maybe other people. Um, and it also associates a minoritized language with modern life, which is a very important thing if we want to attract new speakers, particularly the youth. This has also been linked to the notion of digital readiness. There is the creation or availability of neologisms to talk about this, which happens very often, like just naturally online, be it by adapting a long word or by coining a new word. Such as I have an example here for uh, the verb to tweet that um, in Catalan it can be just tweet aja, which would be like, uh, we adapt a long word, but it, um, Another word has been, it's not coined, like the meaning, um, the word for a bird tweeting, which is piula, has been extended to also just post something on Twitter, right? So yeah, we can use any languages on social media. We can use them for fun. We can use them for more serious stuff. We can share memes. We can share wisdom. We can just interact with each other. We can use any language on social media. But caveat number one, audience design. Audience design, many of you probably know from Bell, 1984, a very common term in social linguistics, right? This idea that you, when you speak, you um, change your, <clears throat> sorry, your linguistic expression to accommodate your address. Um, in minoritized language context, we know that this accommodation happens always towards the dominant language. Um, <clears throat> so that's something to bear in mind when we um, when we talk about um, interaction in minoritized contexts. 
the term was taken um, also by media studies to talk about how they use language to target a specific audience. <coughs> I'm sorry. Such as um, if you want to sell a car, so um, um, targeting the the audience, the people that you actually want to sell this car to. So you would change your language, um, your language use, your linguistic expression, depending on this imagined audience. And language choice online is not very difficult from that. Language, um, the audience of your message online is also imagined. That's not true for all social media platforms, such as WhatsApp, for example. In, in WhatsApp, your audience is not imagined. You know where you are sending the WhatsApp. Um, might be a group, might be a, a person, but um, you have an audience in mind. Um, when, but you, when you tweet something or when you post something on Facebook, you know that it's going to be seen by people that follow you, but that's a very vague audience. It's a very imagined audience. It can also be seen by other people, of course. So what you do is you imagine the subset of people that you are writing for, right? And you can select this audience. Um, myself, for example, I tweet in several different languages, but of course, like when I tweet about something that I think is more relevant for um, uh, people back home in Catalonia, I'm, I will probably tweet it in Catalan. It's a way to select the people that this message is directed to, right? So this is all good and dandy, but we know that speakers of minoritized languages tend to use them in a national languages or English to address the wider audience. Like when they have a message for everyone, that tends to be in, dominal, in the dominant language or in English. And in fact, um, I have myself found that desire to be understood was one of the main reasons why speakers of minoritized languages did not use their language on social media. So <clears throat> there is this risk of minoritized languages um, only being used when targeting a very specific subset of your audience. And that feeds into the minorization cycle in communicative interactions in which you only use the language, you only use the minoritized language with people that you know speak the language and then the language becomes more and more closed in and on itself, right? So that is a huge caveat that we need to try to avoid in social media. And one way to do that is first establish some places in which the language can be used freely. And that would be this idea of breathing spaces. Um, <clears throat> Fishman already talked about this in 1991, a breathing space being a place where the minoritized language can be used freely and without the threat of the majority language. Um, I'm not entirely sure such a place exists without the threat of the majority language, but um, scholars working on translanguaging have rephrased this and retaken this idea of reading spaces, uh, suggesting that for translanguaging practices to be sustainable in contexts where there's a minoritized variety, there has to be a breathing space. There has to be a place where this minoritized variety doesn't have to compete with the majority language. And we talk about competition here, which I think is um, very well suited for social media. <clears throat> so such a space, such a breathing space can be a village, can be an area, of course, in the more traditional sense, but it can also be a virtual community. And here is the, uh, the importance of social media comes here. But what is a virtual community? So that would be your list of friends or the profiles that you follow. So basically this idea of your feed, that might be a virtual community, that might be your virtual community. And also that this particular thing, your feed is also your virtual linguistic landscape. The people you follow, the profiles you follow, they will determine your linguistic landscape. They will determine the linguistic variety that you will see in your feed, right? But a virtual community can also be a group or a server that you're part of. So a Facebook group, a Facebook page, maybe. It can be, um, it can be a server on Discord yeah? and it can be open or closed. Like everyone can join or you have to um, ask for permission to join. But it can also be, and this is um, maybe a more recent um, interpretation, but it can also be all the set of interactions around that hashtag. Um, be it on Twitter, or on Instagram, or on TikTok, or whatever, but like all the interactions that happen around a particular hashtag might also be a virtual community, right? So, for example, we know that hashtags do a lot of things. Um, 
among others, here we have three uh, hashtags can index a topic, can index an audience, and can, can design the audience, sorry, and can index identity. So hashtags can create several communities with some overlap with them. Um, you just think of the of the idea of like if you have a hashtag that um, that is like the hashtag English, the this hashtag may just be the Twitter. The tweet here is related to English somehow, or it's only for people that speak, or it's in English and it's only for people that can read it, or um, maybe you identify as English. So you can put this this idea into any other um, hash that you can think of and. It may just be that you're interested in the topic, um, that it's selecting the the audience that will read this hashtag, maybe for language, maybe for a topic, maybe for other things, but it's also indexing some sort of identity of the people that, um, that use the hashtag. So if we go to describe virtual communities as breathing spaces for minoritized languages, some characteristics that uh, me and my co-author Maggie Glass um, came up with, um, vague, pur purposefully vague and open because there are so many different contexts and so many different situations for different languages that it's very difficult to come up with um, characteristics that like very set characteristics that uh, apply to everyone. But if we want to be open, we can talk about virtual communities as reading spaces when the community, like when the minoritized language is the only language of the community, it's kind of like the first one and it seems obvious. But not only that, there are other different, um, there are other situations in which maybe this is not possible or maybe this is not even advisable. Um, so there's also communities in which this language is a preferred language of the community. Others, other languages are accepted and are used, and that's fine, but this is the preferred one, very typical for learners. Or the language is the subject of discussion. And most importantly, the language status, the status of the language as language, and not just bad variety or whatever is not contested. If we take these characteristics and we turn them into some sort of analytical tool for analysis of these virtual communities, we're basically talking about looking at language use, topics, and status. And after looking at some virtual communities, we found that um, there is a lot of variation in, in all of this, except in status. Uh, status also, you, we we cannot consider a virtual community a breathing space if there is no if the status of the language is contested, right? But we can consider the breathing space in a very wide range of different topics being discussed. And we can also consider the breathing space when um, the, not only when the minoritized language is used exclusively, but also highly multilingual groups or groups in which the dominant language is almost exclusively used, but because the group is just trying to teach this language or <clears throat> the group is just trying to attract new people to the language, right? So there's a lot of, again, different situations that can be covered here. <clears throat> Before I finish, I wanted to mention here more, um, more implicitly that, uh, more explicitly, sorry, that social media is a huge database that we have access to, to retrieve instances of semi-spontaneous language use, study interaction, study community building, study the identity construction, connect with speakers, train on NLP models, retrieve documentation. There's a lot of things that we can do on social media. It's just there open. It's a huge database that we should tap onto. There are some caveats though. Research on social media in general, people think that it's very benign because you know it's public data. So what's the harm in using that? Probably not a lot of harm, but we do need to remember though that recognizability in smaller communities is a possibility. So. And one thing is just tweeting something open to everyone. And the other thing is appearing in a subset of tweets that a researcher has just put together on X language. We need to be careful when we do that because, you know, again, like recognizability is very possible. Uh, there's also the fact that most people, like, people tend to use their minoritized language more often on WhatsApp or on closed Facebook groups or closed Discord servers. So this, they are closed, so they are off limits for research in general. 
And also, um, I didn't have a lot of time to talk about language activism in the presentation, but when we do language activism online, we do have the risk of becoming a standardizing force, and that's something that we want to avoid. And I think that when we treat social media Loki as communities, all these caveats are much more manageable. We treat them as communities and we acknowledge and recognize the relationship that is built uh, with community members in this engagement. And we can see these caveats much more obviously than if we just treat this as, um, as, a, um, as just a, a lot of posts that we can just read and take whenever we want. So thank you very much for watching this presentation. And uh, please come to the Q&A on Thursday, March 4th um, at 11.45 Hawaii time.